All right. Thanks, Tanner, for the intro. Uh, yeah, as the schedule shows, today I'm going to be speaking about algorithms in JavaScript, uh, specifically more for beginners, so people just kind of getting into the workforce or learning about JavaScript for the first time. Uh, Already had a good introduction there, but uh, yeah, I'm a, I work just down the road here at Pluralsight in South Jordan as a full stack dev. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter, I am Tyler W. Clark. There's a lot of stuff that I'm gonna go over today and I'm just kind of throwing it all at you really fast. So if you wanna go back and look at some of my code examples that I'll be walking through, uh, you can check out my Twitter, that's where I'll be posting a link to these slides. <clears throat> all right, so algorithm concepts. When I was making this talk, I went back, I kept iterating on this talk like five different times because I kept moving things around, trying to choose like, what's the most important part? If I was gonna say, let's learn about algorithms, what do you start with, right? Like, do you start with ideas? Do you start with patterns? Do you start with data structures? Do you actually just jump right into some coding concepts of algorithms? And so I kept jumping around and hopefully today, I've kind of given a good breadth of ideas uh, because I, I tweeted this out just a while ago, um, it, algorithms, it's, it's one of the first things that a company will ask you when you're applying for a job and then when you actually get hired, it's one of the last things you actually do, right? Because we have abstractions these days that implement all of our algorithms for us, right? We don't really need to know, you know, quicksort or JavaScript when we use the sort on an array. Like, we don't really care what algorithm it's using to sort our stuff, right? We just call it and it works and it's, and it's really fast. Um, but for whatever reason, this is, you know, this is what we live in today. This is how it works. Um, and actually at Pluralsight, we're changing our interview process from a take-home uh, algorithm type coding assessment to something more um, real life, what we work on, more full stack. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, but this is the world we live in. And so I'm hoping to go over some four main bullet points that hopefully give those, especially beginners into JavaScript or beginning to, to code, um, an idea of some algorithm type stuff. We'll talk about recursion, what that is. We're not gonna go too much in detail about call stacks and whatnot, but just mainly how to implement it. Um, we'll talk about big O notation, some different examples of that. Uh, go over some data structures, and then we're gonna walk through some common algorithms that you might have heard of from interviewing or, or just looking for yourself. So first of all, recursion. Pretty simply put, recursion is just a function that calls itself. So inside its function block, it's referencing itself and invoking itself. For any good recursion function, it has to have at least two, base, two cases. It needs to have a base case to escape the other case, the recursive case, which is gonna get into this infinite calling of itself. And contrary to what you might hear or, or, or think, uh, recursion has no performance benefit over loops. Um, granted, it might be more dynamic than handwriting out loops every time, um, but, in fact, uh, loops sometimes are more performant uh, when iterating over stuff than using recursion. So just a little fun fact on that. So looking at a code example here, we've got just a counter function, right? It's got a for loop inside of it. From zero to 10, we're gonna console.log. Pretty simple, right? You invoke this function, we're gonna go from zero to 10, console log each time. How could we turn this into a recursive function where we can call it, have a function that calls itself but then iterates each time and, and does some type of console logging. It's actually not too difficult to do, and we could do it something like this, where we have a counter function that's gonna take a param, uh, we'll console log that param inside this function, and then we're gonna return calling itself, but in plus one. That way we start at zero, or in this case we're starting at zero, and then we recursively call each time, adding each time. So this, as you can see at the bottom, we're gonna go from zero to infinity or, or throw a, a call stack, a stack overflow exception because this is missing that second case, that base case. So in order to fix that, we add an if check here where we say when uh, n equals 10, we return. So stop the, the calling of itself cycle. So this is that base case, that second case that escapes us from getting into a stack overflow error. And that's pretty much it. Recursion, um, as far as handling it and using it, it's just a function that calls itself. Um, we could spend 30 minutes on recursion, especially with a lot of the features that have come out in JavaScript these days of handling your call stacks and being more dynamic with your stuff. Um, but in the interest of time, I'm keeping it simple. Now let's talk about big O notation. So this one um, is super buzzwordy, right? Like whenever you're working with algorithm stuff, uh, whether someone knows really what that means 
Uh, it doesn't seem to always be the case, it, but it's thrown around a lot, right? Uh, but what is big O notation really? And I've tried to summarize it into some, some bullet points here for, for us to understand. It's not the how long will your algorithm in seconds take to run a completion. It's not a time thing. Big O notation describes how your algorithm or your function, the runtime of it, will grow as the data set that you run it against grows as well. So as your list, let's say we're working with an array of three items, um, your runtime is X. What happens if you run your algorithm on a list of 10, 20, 1,000, million? How, does, how long does it take? How does it affect the runtime of your algorithm? Um, it's also like a worst case scenario. So as we walk through the examples, you'll see we keep this mentality of what is the worst case example? What if the thing you're looking for, or the thing you're sorting, um, has the answer at the very end of your data set? And literally, it is a capitalized O syntax, or the big O syntax. So if we worked with an array, just one, two, three, four, const A, right, it's pretty simple. And we had a function that just returned the last item in your array. Really simple, right? We invoke this function, we pass our list, it returns the last item in our array. The big O notation for this is going to be O to 1. Because it doesn't matter how big our array grows, right, if we have a thousand million, you know, whatever number in our, in our array, our runtime for our algorithm is always going to be one lookup, right? It's going to index in and come out. So this is the big O notation for that simple algorithm. What if we had a loop? So let's say we had a find function where we looped over and we're looking for, we're looking for uh, the number four. It's, kind of, it's grayed out there, but whenever we find the number four, we're going to return a string yes. And in this case, our A variable does have a four, it's at the very end. So as, we, as our algorithm grows, what is our big O notation going to look like? What, is it, what does our runtime potentially grow to if four is the uh, hundredth number in a hundred item list? Well, the big O notation for this function is going to be O to N. N representing the number of items. So our notation for this one is going to be however big our data set that we're running against that's going to be how long potentially it could take us for our, our algorithm to run to completion. And again, represents the number of items in our list. What if we worked with something or like sorting? Most of uh, the sorting algorithms today uh, have to do some type of nesting of loops because the only way to, to sort items directly is you can't just work one at a time through an array because you have to go back through a list and figure out if this one's bigger than the previous item and then so forth and, and so on. So you'll see a lot of nesting of loops. And so in this case, each time we do one loop, we're doing four loops inside of it. So it's growing exponentially. The big O notation for an algorithm that has two nested loops would be O to the n of power of two. If we had a third nested loop inside of that, it'd be O n power of three. So our runtime is gonna grow really fast and it's gonna be really not performant, right, as our list grows. And so big O notation is just the idea of figuring out how quickly your algorithm is going to run. Um, we'll see this example um, later on with uh, binary search, but there's also the idea of cutting your data set in half and seeing if you can work with less amount of your data set um, in order to be more performant. So in this case, we have items 1 through 100. They are sorted. And we have a while loop where we're doing some type of um, middle logic, where we start with zero, start and then end with the biggest, and we jump to the middle. Um, there's a lot that goes on with this stuff, so I just did do stuff, we'll see it later on, but the idea of cutting your data set in half, and then running your logic on half of the data set each time, kind of filtering out, saving you excess amount of loops, gives us O log n. And this is also referred to as log time. Um, if you're getting flashbacks to geometry in high school, I definitely did when I saw this because um, when you see that log term, but it's pretty simple to understand. Logs is, always means log two in this scenario. So if you use this halving process where you cut things in half and you do save your time of looping, um, it actually is extremely fast. If you have a thousand items in our list that we're trying to sort or search, um, if we have a thousand items, 2 to the power of 10 is like 1,080. So our log time or our algorithm time is only going to be um, at max 10 iterations or 10 loops. So if you think of that while loop, um, it's only going to take at max 10 times a loop through our data set if we have 1,000 items, a million, 
two to the power of 20 is like 1,080,000 or something. So the worst case scenario is it takes 20 loops to solve that. So that log time is, is extremely performant, and we'll see it in example later on with binary search. Some other big old notations um, you'll see or get thrown around here is O in log n, which is n times the log time, uh, two to the power of n, or two times n, and then O exponential, which is extremely slow. So just to recap again, I uh, can't stress enough that the big old notation really is not how quickly your algorithm is going to run in seconds. It doesn't give you a time frame. It just describes how quickly your algorithm's runtime is going to grow as it gets run against larger data sets. And it's got that big O syntax. Now let's move into some data structures. Um, if you're new to JavaScript, you're, you, you, you obviously know what objects and arrays are, right? And JavaScript doesn't have a lot of the common algorithm data structures built into other languages. Um, and so with JavaScript, in order to create these data structures ourselves, we have to utilize objects, arrays, and functions to create some of these other common data structures you find thrown around with algorithm terminology. Uh, some of those are linked lists, stacks and queues, trees and graphs, heaps, vectors, array lists, and hash tables. Um, and unfortunately, we're only going to go through the top three of these, uh, just interested in time. But we'll see that using some of the objects and data structures you're familiar with with JavaScript, we can create these um, data structures using just functions, objects, and arrays. So let's start with the linked list. So this is different than an array. It doesn't, uh, you can't index directly into a location. So if you have an array of like six items, you can index into the fourth spot and grab the fourth item, right? It's a quick lookup. With linked list, it doesn't work that way. It is linear, but it has a nesting structure where each object or each node has the location to the next node in the list. So if you wanted to pull out the fourth item, you can't index into a linked list. You have to start at the top and then iterate each next at a time to get to that fourth item. So in JavaScript, we can create a linked list like this. We'll have a function, um, constructor function, called linked list node. It's gonna take a param of data. Um, this dot data equals data, and this dot uh, next is null. So when we first create our nodes, um, it's not gonna have a connected next node in our linked list. And to invoke this, we'll just say new linked list passing in one. So head is now an object that has a data property of one and a next property of null. The way that we would connect a new item in our linked list is we would say head.next equals new linked list node with a value of two. So our linked list will look something like this, where our head is an object, has a data of one, which is that first linked list node, and then in order to get to that second item in our linked list, we have to dot next, and that's gonna show us the data for the next, that next node. And you can continue on and grow your linked list and, and continue this nesting. And this is how we can create a linked list in JavaScript. All right, <clears throat> let's talk about stacks. So stacks are last in, first out. Uh, you can think of them like recursive call stacks. The last function that uh, goes in is the last function that is returned and it bubbles up backwards. So if we're thinking of data like in an array, if we go one, two, three, the way that this would come out of our list would be three, two, one. This is how it would work with, if we were working with a stack. And to create this a stack data structure in JavaScript, we can do um, it's going to have some methods built onto it to kind of help us uh, utilize this stack where it has a way to remove things, add things in the correct format of a stack, um, gives us functions to see if it's empty and, and to grab the top of the stack. So the code like that could look something like this, and this isn't the definition of a, a stack in JavaScript. You can do it many different ways, putting stuff on the prototype or, or whatnot, but this one's just pretty simple. So we have a, another constructor function, create stacked, uh, that we'll new up down at the bottom. Um, our stack is just gonna be an array that we can push items into, whether they're functions or integers, whatever they are. Um, and then we have our methods that are, will be built onto our object that's returned that help us deal with using that stack, removing things in the right order, adding things in the right order, and then so on. Queues are, are somewhat similar, but also kind of different. They're first in, last out, so you can think of this as like a regular queue, right? You're standing in line at the grocery store. First one in line is gonna be the first one out. So as we go one, two, three, since one was in there first, we'll go one, two, and three. So this is how we would work with a queue. 
And similar to Stack, it's going to have some, you'll see it commonly used with some built-on functions that um, you can build yourself, like adding, removing, checking to see what's in there, and removing the top of the queue. Very similar to a stack, it's going to be a constructor function, uh, create queue, it's going to have an array that you can utilize for that queue, pushing things on, removing things in the correct order, and then it has those functions built on that help us work with it. Trees and graphs are sometimes really difficult to understand because it has um, not necessarily a linear one, one at a time path. Um, things are more nested. Uh, each node can have one or more childs in them. Literally think of like a tree. So the example we'll look at is the parent-child relationship. Um, we'll have a node here that can get invoked. Similar to our linked list, it has a value, equals whatever it's given. Children is going to be an array this time and not just null, like our linked list. So let's say that Terry's the father and Katie's his daughter. The way that we would create this tree data structure in JavaScript, we dot onto Terry's children array and push Katie into that, that, that object. So it looks something like this. So again, similar to a linked list, however, the children or that next is not null or another object, it's an array that can have multiple items in here, right? Terry can obviously have more than one child or, uh, and then same with Katie, she can have more than one child and so on. So this would be a tree data structure in JavaScript. Graphs, uh, trees are graphs, but graphs don't have to be trees because graphs can be cyclical, so they can point back to each other. So the, uh, the parent-child relationship doesn't really work in this scenario. Uh, I like to think of it more of like friends, right? You can be someone's friends and they can be your friend. So there's that um, cycle reference. So the way that we would throw, would throw the tree example of nesting, right, because Kitty can point back to Terry, right, you can't, that doesn't really work. So the way we would do that with uh, a graph in JavaScript, it would be more flattened, right? So Terry is a property on an object and the array is his friends and we'll say that Katie is Terry's friend and then Terry is also Katie's friend um, and that the Han Hannah is friends with only Terry and not Katie. So this is how we would create a graph data structure, a way to have things point back to each other. These are all really common and used with our algorithms um, that we'll walk through here. Uh, again, I, I have some coding here, but already running, kind of running out of time, so I'm going to be kind of blowing through these. So if you want to go back through the coding examples, uh, I'll be tweeting it out later on, so check that out. So the first one we're going to talk about, so the first three are sorting mechanisms, sorting algorithms, selection sort, bubble sort, quick sort, and binary search. Selection sort is the idea of first looping over every item in your list. Inside of that loop, you're calling another function that loops over every item in the list and returns the largest item from the list, re returns it, pushes it into a newly created list, and then removes it from the original list. So it has that nesting of loops. So top layer here, we have 32416. We want to sort this array. Uh, we'll call the selection sort function with that list. We notice we have the while loop in here. So while we have something in our list, uh, we're going to do that, start that initial top layer lo looping. We'll have this function that says find largest value and assigns us a large item. So this is how, this is the function that it itself will also loop and click through, step through a list and return the largest one each time. So this is that nesting, this is how our algorithm is going to grow as our list grows. The big notation for this is O in two, right? Because it has that nested loop. Even though it's a little bit different, it's not two for loops, it's a while, then a four, and it's being called inside of it. If you step back and look at the whole function, it's just a, a loop inside of another loop, so it gives us O to the power of two. Bubble sort is very similar to that. It's, a, it's again, a nesting of loops here. Uh, but instead of a function that goes through and finds the largest one and returns it, um, this one actually does like a, a bubble, like pop and and push kind of thing, that's the bubble type to it, where it loops inside of a loop, but then it checks each neighbor one at a time and switches it as it goes through each item in the list. So it looks something similar like this, where we have the nesting of loops, um, and as items in the list is greater than the item before that, um, it'll just invoke a function that switches them, and it'll go through each loop, uh, each item one at a time until everything's all sorted. This is going to have the same big old notation, O to N to 2. Quicksort, uh, you could spend 30 minutes talking about Quicksort and trying to visualize what the heck it's doing, but so I didn't uh, do any code on this one. Speaking more high level on Quicksort, um, it is one of the fastest uh, sorting because best case scenario, it is O log N. 
Um, and worst case is O to N to the power of 2, so similar to bubble and selection, but that's pretty rare. Um, this one utilizes recursion and a pivot where it works with having data or partitioning data smaller and larger on size, on, on different sides of your array. So best case scenario, you loop over having your data set, and that's the N log N time. Um, this is one of the most efficient uh, quick, uh, sorting algorithms that are, that, that's out there today. And the last one, uh, binary search, search um, has that log time, which is super fast. It requires taking a sorted list, uh, so it has to, be, has to be sorted. So if you think of like a phone book, if you were tasked to go through and find someone's name that wasn't alphabetized, it would take you forever, right? The bigger notation for that would be O to N, linear. You have to step through one at a time until you find that person. Uh, a binary search is the process of working with an alphabetized phone book and if I am looking for something with the letter of C, it'll jump right to the you know, P or whatever's in the middle of the alphabet. And then C, is P is C greater than P? Okay, if it is, then I don't need to continue looping on through the rest of the phone book. I need to get that top half. And then it jumps to the middle of that. And it continues jumping to the middle to create that log time, that having mechanism. Um, again, it, it requires taking a sorted list. Uh, it doesn't work if it's not sorted, right? Because the having is kind of pointless. This is gonna have that same logic that we saw before, the low, high, mid functionality, where it needs to determine the lowest and the highest and guess a middle. We're flooring it, so we have to deal with decimals. Um, inside the search, we have that logic. We're gonna do a while loop, guessing a mid-level. Our guess will be that middle point in our list. If it is the item, hey, we found it, return true. If our guess is too high, then we're gonna mutate our high variable reset it to be mid minus one, the index location for it. And other than that, it has to be too low, so then we update our mid to be, um, we update our low variable to be mid plus one. And this loop will continue on until it either finds it or returns null. Then again, this is the quickest uh, uh, binary, uh, the big old notation you can find. So if you ever get stuck, kind of like a tip that I think of, uh, if you're trying to like, if you're in an, if you're in an interview question, and someone's like, can you make it faster? Because there's always a catch, right? I always try to think of, is there any way that I can like have this data set? Can I work with a smaller data set than what I'm doing now and then just double it? Like, can I have it in any way? Like quick sort is right, it's the fastest because it figures out a way to partition data into a smaller and a larger half. Binary search is super fast because it's a way of having data and adding it. So just a little tip, if, you, if you're curious and you're trying to figure out ways to make something faster, think of that. How can you have it and work with a smaller data set? Saves you, saves you that looping iteration. Uh, just to wrap up, I have uh, just a quote that I like, and I thought this was really applicable to algorithms, one by Steve Jobs. Everyone in this country should learn how to program a computer because it teaches you how to think. And I think this, it's one of my favorite quotes when I was learning how to program and learning because it's, it's so true. And algorithm stuff is no different. You have to learn how to process problems and, and think through them as quickly as possible. Um, some other references, uh, something that I really enjoyed was reading Cracking the, the Coding Interview. It's a really big book, find it on Amazon. It walks through tons of different scenarios that uh, can help you with common coding algorithm questions. The Imposter's Handbook, and then obviously there's uh, online references on Egghead, Pluralsight, Frontend Masters, that kind of stuff. So I'll be posting a link to these slides if you wanna go back through them. Thanks.